Okay, so now we're going to talk about trauma. And in this video, we'll do a quick introduction and we'll talk about the trauma primary survey. So trauma has a few things that makes it a very unique disease process. The first is that it will always be with us. I can't see any time when people are going to stop shooting each other, stabbing each other, or taking silly risks out on the expressway, or doing silly uh, stunts. Trauma is the leading cause of death in young people, especially in the first four decades of life in most developed countries. And it's unique in that it is a multi-organ system disease, whereas if you have a patient with chest pain, they're going to probably hurt somewhere in their chest, and it's going to be either their lungs or their heart that's causing the pain. But if someone is thrown from their vehicle, they can injure almost any organ in their body. So it's very important that we have a systematic approach to trauma so we don't miss any injuries. So let's look at this poor unfortunate fellow here who was thrown from his car and then hit the tree. Luckily there was a bystander watching who called 911 on their cell phone and soon an ambulance came to the scene. The paramedics come out, they grab the patient, put him into their ambulance and zoom him off to the nearest hospital. In the United States, this is the common scenario, and the reason why we do this is because we want to get them uh, to the hospital as quickly as possible because we want to get them resuscitated in that critical first golden hour where we can limit mortality if we get the patient resuscitated in that first hour. Now this is in contrast to the European system or other systems where doctors might ride along in the ambulance. If you'll remember back to when Princess Diana uh, hit that bridge in uh, Paris, when the ambulances arrived on scene, they had doctors in there too, and they set up an entire operating theater right there on the expressway. The thought there is that why waste time driving to the hospital when we can actually start resuscitating the patient right there on the scene? I would think they do things differently. Number one, for a philosophical difference, they think that uh, on-site resuscitation is better than w wasting time transporting them. But I'll bet a little bit of it has to do with the fact that those European cities are not easy to navigate and it's not easy to get to a hospital quickly, whereas here in the U.S., especially a big city like Chicago, you can't throw a rock without hitting a the hospital. They're just so close, so it's easy to get to a hospital quickly. So now we're back in the United States and this ambulance is going to zoom as fast as they can and try to get to a hospital, preferably a level one hospital. So the trauma centers are designated by various different levels, designated by the uh, American College of Surgeons. So a level one trauma center is a hospital that can handle a lot of trauma, and they have uh, 24 hours a day, a full range of specialists there. they got surgeons, they're trauma surgeons, emergency physicians, anesthesiologists, neurosurgeons, orthopedics, plastics, anybody that they may need. Have, they have 24-hour coverage. They'll usually have residencies there as well. So it's a research place, a teaching place, and they got plenty of staff and plenty of experience. Level 2 centers may not have the same numbers. They may not have a residency there, but they do have available pretty much all the specialties and equipment that they need. So they're not as good as a level 1, but they're pretty darn close. And this is what you might have uh, that, that they work in conjunction with the level one centers. Now level three centers, they'll have the ER docs, they'll have surgeons, they'll have trauma ICU patients, etc. But they might not have all of the specialties available. So this might be what you have in those rural hospitals or um, certain community hospitals. Level four will have even less resources. It might just have an emergency room that is capable of providing some resuscitation, but they got to transfer those patients out. And level five, they may have an emergency room, but the doc might not be there 24 hours a day, and they got to call them in. So they can resuscitate people, and they got a nurse there probably who is specialized in resuscitation as well. The only other type of trauma center we have are pediatric trauma centers. So these are places that obviously, as it's named, are good at taking care of trauma in kids. If you're watching this from Chicago, the level one trauma centers around here are Cook County Hospital, Mount Sinai Hospital, Loyola, Northwestern, Illinois Masonic. I'm sure I'm missing a few, and there's several level two and level three hospitals in the area as well. 
So if I get shot in Chicago, do I want to go to the local, nice, posh, fancy, level 3 community hospital that's very nice, or do I want to go to the county center, which is a level 1? You bet I want to go to the level 1 trauma center, because you know they'll know how to take care of traumatic patients. So after arriving at our trauma center, we bust through the doors into the ER, and now it's up to the trauma team to take care of this trauma patient. And especially in a trauma center, a trauma team is going to consist of lots of people. Some will be nurses, some will be docs, some will be techs, and one of them will be you. And you're in charge of resuscitating this patient. And as with every patient that comes in the emergency room, we always start with the primary survey. And the primary survey is a list of things that we're going to do, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, whatever. Uh, and they don't always happen in order, they all kind of happen at the same time. It is your job to make sure that everything is going on. That list is there to help you remember to do all of them. If you were all by yourself and it was just you and a nurse, then maybe you got to go in order. But not here. You're in a trauma center. you got enough people. Do it all at once. And the first thing I would probably yell out is IVO2 monitor. And not just any IV. You know what? Give us two large bore IVs, one in each arm. And now we're ready to look at the primary survey. So the primary survey consists of our alphabet. Now the primary survey used to be, in our other discussions, just ABCs. And that's great, airway, breathing, and circulation. However, in trauma, you may have heard somewhere that we extended a little bit to ABCDE. And I've even heard people take it even further to go F, G, H, and I. So let's look at each one of these separately. A is obviously airway, as it always has been. If the patient is not breathing, or they've got some sort of expanding neck mass, or they have no gag reflex, or they're obtunded, or you're worried that you're going to lose the airway, they're not ventilating, they're not oxygenating, intubate them. Do it early. Get that problem out of your way, because you're going to have a hundred other problems to deal with. So take care of the airway. Along with the airway, though, you want to talk about the C-spine. Think about it, because you don't want to crank this person's head back as you're trying to intubate them and then cause a fracture uh, of an unstable neck and then thereby paralyzing them. So if you do have to intubate someone who is a trauma patient, maybe get someone to hold both sides of their head and prevent their neck from bending and their head from being lifted off the bed. So think of airway and C-spine together. So breathing, that means really two things when you're looking at a trauma patient, and that's going to be a tension pneumothorax and a hemothorax. If you're noticing that there's decreased breath sounds on one side, the trachea is deviating, uh, they've got JVD, they're hypotensive, then you think, ah, oh, I think we've got a tension pneumothorax, then you're going to put a uh, needle decompression, you're going to stick a needle second intercostal splice, mid-clavicular line, and decompress that thing. Similarly, massive hemorrhage in the chest can also affect your breathing, and so that patient may need a chest tube in order to allow them to ventilate. Now let me make one point here. In the primary survey, we're looking at things that are going to kill him right now if we don't take care of it. So if the guy's pulse ox is 89%, but he's doing okay, uh, then leave it for now. It doesn't mean it's not a problem, and it doesn't mean we're not going to deal with it. We're just going to deal with it later. Right now, we're dealing with immediately fatal things if left alone. So tension, pneumothorax, hemothorax here. C, that's circulation. So what are the top three causes of hypotension and shock in a trauma patient? It's hemorrhage, bleeding, and blood loss. So you know what they need. They need blood. Now the ATLS classifies uh, shock into three different kinds, or four different kinds, class one, two, three, and four, with each one becoming progressively uh, more and more shocky. The first two uh, you're just maybe a little bit low blood pressure, a little tachycardic, and you get to three and four, you're tachycardic and hypotensive, you're becoming obtunded, altered mental status, and losing more and more blood. Uh, the first two give normal saline, and then after that give blood. My recommendation is give two liters of normal saline, it's not going to hurt anyone, but after the first two liters, go straight to blood. And if you're going to give blood, what kind are you going to give? You're going to give O negative, or you can give O positive to guys. The universal donor blood. At the same time, you can send off a type and cross, and when that's ready, you can get type and cross blood for this patient. But right now, you don't have time. Get that O negative or O positive in there, hook it up to a rapid transfuser that warms up the blood, and get that in the patient as fast as possible. So start with say normal saline and then go to blood. So what is D? D is just a fancy way 
to make a neuro exam start with the letter D. So that's disability. And this is going to be your Glasgow Coma Scale, which is a quick way of looking at your eyes, verbal and motor skills. The way I remember this is that eyes, I think of four eyes, like wearing glasses, so that goes up to four. V for verbal is also a Roman numeral five, so that's five. And then you can think of an inline six motor, so motor goes to six. So the lowest score that you can get here is a three. A piece, the piece of wood coming in is going to get a three. The highest score you can get is 15. And the way I remember it is, at the top numbers you're doing everything spontaneously, the bottom you're not doing it at all, and everything in between you're going uh, gradual levels down. So spontaneous eyes open, opens to verbal, opens to painful stimulus, doesn't open at all. Verbal, you're talking, conversing normally, speaks when spoken to, uh, confused, makes just a bunch of sounds and doesn't speak at all. And same thing with motor. You had spontaneous movements, response to command, to painful stimulus, D, cor uh, corticate and decerebrate positioning, and you're not moving at all. So get this neuro exam quickly. It's very important because if you intubate the guy and now you got him sedated and paralyzed, you have no more neuro exam. How are you going to know if his head's bleeding? You're not going to, right? So get a neuro exam at the beginning. Remember, all of this is happening concurrently. E stands for exposure. And this means two things. Number one, it means take all the clothes off the patient because if you've got this big wound that's shooting blood out, you want to find that. You need to control that bleeding. So you need to expose everything and look everywhere. Look in the armpits. Look between the butt cheeks. Look between the panis. Look in between the legs and the crotch and find anything that is hemorrhaging and put some pressure on that. E also stands for exposure, meaning they're going to get cold. So you hypothermia is horrible for trauma patients, so put some warm blankets on them after you've done a quick look over. This exposure does not mean we're doing a full exam, it just means we're looking real quick for anything that's bleeding horribly. The F stands for fast exam, and that stands for focused abdominal sonography for trauma and basically what you're doing is you're looking at the abdomen with the ultrasound Ult fast exam used to be part of the physical but now it's graduating into the primary survey because you want to know are they bleeding in their stomach is there something that we need to take care of and the fast exam looks at a couple of areas it looks between the spleen the spleen and the kidney the liver and the kidney the bladder and the rectum and then you get a long view of the heart just looking for any bleeding there Okay, these other ones are going to go a little bit faster. G stands for glucose, so get a quick AccuCheck. And I've also heard it stand for girl, which just reminds you to check a pregnancy test. Do you have one trauma patient or do you have two trauma patients? It's important to know, right? H stands for hang antibiotics. You got someone with massive lacerations or open fractures or an open skull or something viscerated. Get antibiotics in there. Let's keep them from getting septic. It's very important to get that earlier. Uh, then later. And the last one, I stands for inject tetanus. They probably will need a tetanus shot, and yeah, that's not going to kill them if you miss it, but you, it's quick enough to do, and you're definitely going to forget it later. Uh, so if you have time, go ahead and do that. So that's it. That's our primary survey for trauma. And the whole idea of this thing is we want to make sure that the patient doesn't die right away, that we resuscitate them quickly. All right. In the next video, we're going to look at the secondary survey. See you then.